Hello and welcome to this new episode of Commodore 64 Games Reverse Engineering. I'm going to be reverse engineering a complete game and providing all of the source code so that you can actually use this source code to then create your other games. I'm going to be looking at the Shoot'em Up Construction Kit. So why create all of this new code? Well, to reduce slowdown and flicker in SIAC games that we used to see before. Remove the sprite to background scroll start stop wobble. This is where the sprites kind of slightly disconnect from the background when scrolling starts or stops. And also remove the wasted memory because there is quite a lot of editor code and graphics still mostly present in the final game. This will allow a lot of extra functionality to be added to games because there is full source code and it can be completely customized, for example, by adding extra player weapons upgrades or super weapons, for example, parallax scrolling, enemy homing bullets where enemies can fire at you. Enemy movement AI can be improved rather than just having a pre-recorded attack wave. The title screen can be improved and also adding functionality like high score tables would be quite possible because there's full source code. In the previous videos, we looked at enemy movement and how the attack waves work. There's just one final thing to sort out for the enemy now, and that's to process the what's called enemy bits in the object editor, in the SIRC editor. Let's have a look at what those enemy bits look like in the editor so we can familiarize ourselves with it. In the editor, for the edit object menu, we have edit enemy bits which is the E key as a shortcut. So the player ship doesn't have, I'm pressing E and there's actually no enemy bits screen. And that's obvious because it's the player ship. Also the enemy bullets don't have the player explosions, the player bullets, the enemy deaths. It's only the actual enemy types which have enemy bits. So I'm going to create like a blank enemy here just using a differently colored player sprite here so changing the sequence to be one and uh, select sprite and place is f7 that's right so putting the player ship there in the first slot creates a differently colored enemy now if i press the e key you can see here that we have the enemy bits editing screen Let's note down what we see on this enemy bits screen because we will need this information later on when we are reverse engineering the data in the save file. Let's put these windows side by side. Okay, so first of all, we have speed. And then we have the points that the player gets when the enemy is destroyed and the hits to kill. That should be quite self-explanatory, right? How many hits to kill the enemy? Then we have the fire type, the fire rate, and the bullet speed that is used for this enemy. The, the bullet animations don't have a speed per se. The speed is set by the enemy shooting the bullets. Then we have the explosion special effects, the sound effects rather, and the bullet sound effects, this effects. And then we have the explosion object, and then the bullet object. Those link back to the animation explosion object and animation bullet object for the enemies. Then we have the collision configuration. So the, conf the collision configuration here tells the enemy what to do when they collide from enemy to ship. That is the player ship. Whether or not the enemy dies or the ship dies and also enemy to bullet, that's also obviously uh, enemy to player bullet. The enemy bullets don't collide with enemies, it's just that the enemy bullets collide with the player. Whether or not the um, enemy dies or the bullet dies. So the, the player bullets can either stop when they hit an enemy or go straight through the enemy and then whether or not the enemy dies is a separate configuration item. We can change the points from 0, going all the way up to 255. That should not be a surprise in the Commodore 64 because it's an 8-bit computer. Each byte has 8 bits inside it and 
if you know your binary arithmetic, then uh, 8 bits is 0 to 1111111111, which is 255 in decimal. So the points seem to be multiplied by 10, and we seem to have a byte value straight away there, so we'll look for a byte value for that field in, in the save game file. We can see that the fire type goes through, well, it starts with blank, which is nothing, and then it has a little arrow there which rotates all the way around. And then we have uh, directional fire, random fire, um, a, a cross or plus shape, and then a, an X shape as well. So it's, it's either a vertically oriented plus shape, cross shape, or, or an X, like a capital X there. The, the, the directions go all the way around the eight directions, starting from top, going pointing upwards basically, and then rotating clockwise. The fire rate uh, tells the game engine how often this should fire. So fire rate 50, I think, should uh, fire a bullet every second because there are 50 frames a second in this panel version of SIOC. So I think that's the way it's mapped out. The bullet speed is from 0 to 3. Uh, thinking about this, uh, I'm going through the values here and uh, the fire rate is also probably a byte, although it's limited from uh, 1 to 99. I think that's probably a byte. Um, the fire type has, what is it, 8? eight directions plus nine, one for the none, so that's nine, plus, uh, plus X, R, and D, so that's plus four more, so that's what, 13 different values, so that's 13 different values can be expressed minimally using four bits. Uh, the bullet speed from zero to three is a two-bit value, minimally, so zero to three. You would need two bits to, to uh, express the value 3 in decimal. Uh, the hits to kill 1 to 15. Um, 15, the largest value there can be expressed as 4 bits in binary. Uh, the speed for the enemy's movement, again 1 to 3, uh, the largest value there, 3 can be expressed in three bit, uh, 2 bits. So I'm just starting to think about the bit sizes of this data. So what we need to do, like we've done in all of the previous videos, is create some base data that we're going to start comparing with. I'm going to create uh, an enemy bullet, change the sequence so that we have only one frame being used. Okay, so that's the enemy bullet one, just a differently colored player bullet. And then we have actual enemy one and we're going to use uh, the player sprite for that. Again we're going to change the sequence there we go and then if I save that all data as uh, base data then we can start working through the data values by making changes to the data in the editor and then saving that and then using the binary difference comparison tool to show us what's changed in the file and then we look for a part of the file which seems to have that data so we're going to I'm going to first of all uh, change uh, all of the values I think so that they're different the reason why I'm doing this is that I want to try and change the maximum amount of data so that the the maximum number of bytes will appear to be changed in the file in a hopefully continuous block and this will allow us to see the data a lot easier don't forget when going between these different menu screens the the editor's data uh, will also update different parts of the machine's memory so when we're saving all data then those different editor screen states and stuff like that will also be in the save file, so that's a little bit confusing for us, unfortunately. So let's just note down what the uh, starting values are for the, uh, for the base file. 
I forgot to do that earlier on, so let's just do that. Because it will help us to understand the data in the all data file if we know what the starting values are. Right. Kind of obvious, really. For ease of typing in, I'm avoiding using uppercase characters for no and yes and stuff like that. So that's the base file. Now the first file that we save, I'm going to change everything again. So changing the fire rate to be something that should hopefully be obvious to see. Here we go, let's twiddle, twiddle these values around so that they're opposite from the default. And is that all of the data changed? Yeah, so let's note down the new values. So the points uh, is 10, but I have a feeling that's going to be a byte value of one. So I changed it from none to be up, which is the first direction in that list. All of these other values are just flipped. So if we assume that there's at least two bits being used for the speed, uh, the points is one byte hits to kill plus speed plus bullet speed might be two bytes, the firing three bytes, the direction, mm, I don't know, maybe for the, well, we'll see, maybe five or six bytes. Looking at this, if we squish all of the data together into minimal bit patterns. So thinking ahead, we'll need another file at least, maybe a couple more files with changed data. So I'm just changing the, these ones to hopefully make it easier to compare the, the data files and then to see where these values are being encoded. I'm also changing uh, these back again so that hopefully we'll be able to differentiate between the values for the sound effects and the values for the animation object indexes to use. I'm just noting the change values. If the values haven't changed in one file compared to the previous file, then I'm leaving it blank because it will be easier to see the changes in this table. The important thing here to remember is that for all of this kind of work, uh, it's a lot easier to be uh, methodical and incremental about this kind of thing. You don't want to make too many assumptions for each change you're introducing. So straight away I can see that this block of memory seems to be changed and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytes long. If we have a look at this data as well, uh, the so the new data is on the left, the existing, the original data is on the right, the base data is on the right. So these new bytes here seem to have changed and there we go, I'm going to swap it around. So by convention, I, I normally like the base data or the previous data to be on the left and the new data to be on the right. It's like, you know, left to right reading order, right? And then if I have a look between files one and two, I can also see, well, okay, so the, the editor state data, <clears throat> you can see here, look, this is base all data. So um, this is editor state editor menu state data, so I'm not interested in that. It's far too many bytes changed. Um, I'm looking for at least, remember I looked at the bit sizes for this, I'm looking for at least five or six bytes, hopefully in a contiguous block, uh, all changed. So although that's possible, I think that's far too high up in memory. Uh, it was probably in character or sprite memory right at the end there, so I'm not interested in that. Uh, this, however, does look interesting to me. And if you notice, look, there's a whole repeated pattern of bytes. So we've got 11, 10, 24, 94, 0, 0, 0. And then we've got 11, 10, 24, 94, 0, 0, 0. So we have this repeating pattern in this block here. But the when all of the things were changed in the enemy bits configuration for the first enemy, we changed everything. And then we have this block of changed bytes at the beginning of this repeating block of memory. So this kind of like indicates to me that this is a very likely candidate 
for the first enemy bits being changed and the remaining enemy bits, don't forget that there are quite a few enemy types that can be configured and they all need their own individual enemy bits. So, and by default I think they're all the same value as well, right? It kind of makes sense if they are. Uh, so, let's do a quick calculation here. So the ending address of this changed block of memory is what, 291F? And then we subtract that from the start of the changed memory block, which is 2824. And then we have FB bytes. If we divide that by 7, which is that repeating pattern length from the first 11 in hex to the next 11 in hex is 7 bytes. Um, and then we check to see how many actual enemy slots we have. We've got one here, and then all the way up to do 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 uh, enemy type thirty six. So we have thirty six enemies, and then in decimal, okay, so it's rounded down, uh, but basically, so I think we can safely assume that this block of memory. Uh, contains all of the enemy bits that are being that are configurable in the editor. This is the uh, file offset. We're going to have to convert that to uh, the memory offset at some point. Don't forget. But for now, I'm just noting down the file offset because uh, I want to maintain the memory address rather than the file offset. But anyway. If we have a look at the bits that have changed, the base value is this, that's the original data, and then the, the data for the updated enemy in the one file is that, and then we have a look at the two files, so we have a look at the changed bytes in the two file, and we'll just copy the, the seven bytes there from, what was it, two, eight, two, Four in the file offset. So now we have from top to bottom the base to one file to two file there which corresponds to those pieces of changed information. So let's start having a look here. So the first byte, uh, the uh, low nibble of the first byte changes from one to two to two. So what values change from one to two and then stay at two? in the data that we have changed here it could be the bullet sound effects because I it started off as one in the one file and then changed it to two and then in the two file it remains at two right so it could be the bullet sound effects let's just add a few extra columns to this table to contain the decoded uh, memory address offsets or rather the offsets into the data structure so uh, let's make a, an educated guess here that the bullet sound effect is the first or zero right the zero offset in other words the first byte but computers like start counting from zero so uh, the zero byte offset we'll just put some documentation here for what I'm planning on adding so ln equals low nibble hn equals high nibble um, we also want the the byte offset value into the table so let's put that into two different columns so there we go zero offset and then low nibble is the bullet sound effects so we'll put a little uh, marker to tell us that we've already decoded that nibble in that byte so that we don't try and consider it again. The next value that I'm going to look at now is the high nibble of that zero byte. So the high nibble it changes from one to two to one and it could be the explosion sound effects or it could be the explosion object, right? But I'm willing to guess that it's going to be the explosion sound effects because it makes sense that the value for the sound effects is going to be grouped together. Uh, we can make triple sure that that's the case by again changing 
uh, a piece of data to known values here. So we're going to put three and four there, I think, in the third file. So this is going to be the next file that gets saved out so that we can differentiate between the sound effects and the object reference numbers or index numbers, if you like. Uh, maybe just for you know clarity, I should change these values too so that they are easily visible. Um, so let's do that as well. That's going to make it incredibly obvious. Uh, let's change uh, the speed as well to 3. So let's save that as file 3. Whizzing along with warp mode enabled. There we go. Doesn't then do a little comparison. Pick out the changed data. There we go. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of like makes it obvious already uh, based on my recollection of what we're assuming here. So yes, it's not an assumption anymore testing the hypothesis, we're able to confirm that the low nibble is uh, definitely the bullet sound effects and the high nibble of the zero offset, zero by offset is the explosion sound effects. So I think we can safely confirm that now. The next value that I want to have a look at, uh, well, there are, uh, what, 13 values? I think it was in this fire type and it's changing from zero and then staying at one if we assume that zero is none and that one is the uh, up direction then I think that what we're looking at there is is I think the hits to kill is different because it starts at one and then goes to two and doesn't change so I think that this one here uh, the bite offset one high nibble, I think that that, look, that looks like the hits to kill. But the fire type is one value and then three lots of unchanged new values. So that's probably the, the low nibble of bite offset one. But we can check that later on by doing another file save with a different uh, changed value. Let's have a look, see if we can pick out any more obvious uh, obvious byte values. So uh, remember, um, although you know the fire rate from one to ninety-nine could be encoded in seven bits because seven bits gives you zero to one hundred and twenty-seven. Um, I don't think the, the, the last bit would be used for anything. So I think probably assume that if we have a look at this, then those two values there, 24 and 32, correspond to 36 and 50 in decimal. So I think we can safely assume that byte offset 2 is the fire rate. Uh, this value here, 94, 6b, 6a, 7a, now that looks a little bit more complicated. Let's have a look at the next one along. Uh, so this is, what is it, 0, 1, 0, for the low nibble, so zero one zero four. We're looking for something which changes with these delta values, and I think it's going to be that one. Look, so there's. If we assume that the explosion offset is indexed in the editor, it's it displays it as one. But don't forget that computers like start counting for, like to start counting from zero. So I think that. Uh, the explosion objects 1215 is actually encoded as 0104, which is basically minusing 1 from the rendered object index in the editor. And then the same for the bullet object as well. So the bullet object is 1226, which if it's indexed starting from 0 in the data, then it's 0115 because 6 minus 1 is 5, 2 minus 1 is one and one minus one is zero. So I think that we can assume that that data there is the for the for the explosion object and bullet object index values. Mm. By offset five is all zero and it doesn't change from all zero. Interesting. Unused data. And the last one here is so that the points 
don't forget, were multiplied by 10, but they actually varied from 0 to 255 multiplied by 10 in the editor. So I have a feeling that by offset 7 is going to be the 8 bits used to encode the points score. Because I didn't change the points apart from in the first file and then of course I didn't change them again in, in the second and third file so they remained the same value which was 10 points each which is multiplied by 10 so that's 1 in reality. So we have a look at the data that hasn't been mapped out yet and it's basically the speed of points, the fire type and the bullet speed and the collision data. So, but let's change the points value uh, and then save that as file 4. So we just change the points value to, don't forget, the points value was changed to be 50. So although the editor displays it as 50, it's multiplied by 10. So we're going to look for probably a 5 in there. So let's have a look at offset 2824. And then immediately we can see there, look, the last byte offset in this repeating memory chunk here for the rest of the enemies. Uh, we can immediately see where a 5 has been introduced. This is going to be extremely obvious right, right there. There it is. So we know with 100% certainty, I'm pretty sure that, well, no, 100% certainty is absolutely sure. Anyway... <laughs> So there we are. So we, we found, we've managed to figure out the encoding for that byte there. Uh, gradually reducing or ticking items off from this table of things that need to be understood. And this is the great, really great thing about reverse engineering is uh, this methodical workflow uh, is, is just, actually for my brain it's quite soothing to have a nice methodical understood workflow. And of course, copious, copious amounts of note taking, note, note taking rather. Evidently, I need more coffee. Uh, so now we're getting into the realm of slightly more difficult to understand values, especially this byte value here. Um, let's start noting down the bit patterns for each byte from these hex numbers here. That's 94, not 9A. See, my eyesight is terrible these days, isn't it? That's not very good. Right, so anyway, um, the base value has a bit pattern value of this. That's 94, yes. Uh, the next value is 6B, boink. So we'll put that there. Uh, the, the next value after that is 6A. So when I do reverse engineering like this in a methodical building up a table, checking the, the bits off that I need to look at, and then literally ticking off the bytes and the bits that I understand, or at least I'm pretty sure that I understand doing it this way. It's hard not to go wrong, really, as long as you think about how values can be encoded, and usually as long as there's no encryption or scrambling, hopefully, then usually, you know, Fellow programmers would usually store these bits in logical ways. Usually, not always. Sometimes, you know, the code has been incrementally updated and then the bits are all over the place because they're squeezing in bits in different places because they didn't want to upgrade the data patterns and stuff like that. But usually, hopefully, if it's been well designed or if it's been well maintained with lots of changes, even, you know, well maintained lots of changes can still be grouped nicely. The data will be grouped nicely in memory so that hopefully it's easy to understand. Anyway, so we're looking for values now from bit index bit position 0, so the, the least significant bit, in other words by convention the bit which, is, which occurs on the right of a binary number. Uh, we're looking for a value that changes from 0 to 1 to 0 to 0 to 0. And that is basically the collision enemy to ship enemy die uh, information. Now, the collision flags are all, is, is either yes or no. And yes or no is either 0 or, or 1 or 0, right? Or 0 or 1. Um, 
it's a binary choice. So this is why we're considering individual bits now. Within a byte is because we're looking for potential um, bit values for the collision. So we're going to try and understand these first and map them out first. Um, that's definitely bit index 1. This is bit, bit index 2 and it corresponds to uh, on, off, 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 which is the third one there. And then the four, or the third bit index, which is the fourth one really, um, because computers count from zero, uh, that is enemy to bullet, bullet die. So we've mapped out these bits within that byte now. Four bits grouped together correspond to that low nibble of this byte. So we're getting there. We just have the high nibble now of that byte to consider these last four bits. And what's the data in, that's left in the table? So the data that's left in the table is speed. But speed will need at least two bits to encode because it's values from one to three. Or probably values from zero to three, but zero is not used. So anyway, at least two bits there to encode a value of three. And then the bullet speed also likewise is zero to three this time. So that needs at least two bits in binary because two bits in binary is up to a maximum value of three. So, oh yeah, we've got the fire type, but that leaves, the, you know, the fire type is 13 values, which needs at least four bits. So I think we can safely assume that the fire type is going to be that nibble there in by offset one, right? So we're not looking for a fire type being encoded in these remaining four bits. I think we're looking at grouped two bit values now, which is going to be the speed. So the speed is one, two, two, three, three. And I think that that's what we see in that lower two bits there. So uh, bits four and five of that byte, in other words, the lowest two bits of that high nibble for this byte is that. And then we've got a value of, what is it? Two, one, 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 and that is the bullet speed there because the bullet speed changes or it starts at two and then gets changed to one, 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 one in the remaining files. So we've mapped out those bits there. So that's bits six to seven of byte offset three. We're getting there, right? Just this last fire type to understand. So if we assume that none is zero and then up is one and then two, three, four, five, and then pointing down, right? So down, if we go clockwise around the eight directions then pointing down is number five, okay? Uh, up is one, upright is two, three might be pointing to the right, down right might be four, down is hopefully going to be five. So let's see if that data corresp or that assumption corresponds to what we see in the file for that for that uh, last piece of data, that last nibble which is inside that byte. I can see it already. It's there. It look, it's changed from 21 to 25. The high nibble is not what we're interested in right now. We've already mapped that one. The high nibble was the hits to kill. The low nibble, there we go. So we seem to have uh, all of the data mapped out in that file. Uh, and the only thing that we're not entirely sure about are the values for the uh, fire type, the direction list, in other words. So we have, let's go back to the editor and see what we really have. Now, the rendered editor order might be different to the byte order, of course. That might always be the case, but we can start making little assumptions, I think, because hopefully it's going to be nice and logical. So we've got, starting from the beginning, none up, then upright, then right, then down, right, then down, then down, left, and then left, and then left, up, or up, left. But anyway, that's what we have. And then what do we have after up left, we have uh, plus x 
and then we have do you remember what it was uh, random and directional right so let's assume that that's zero and one and two three four five and so on writing down the hex values so I don't need to keep on translating from hex to decimal and vice versa so let's put a star there and let's not forget to put a star there too because we've definitely mapped out all of those values they correspond to the byte 3 values there that's the high nibble we've mapped out all of those so we can tick those off it's just these ones I wonder why that, that looks like it's spare empty memory right I wonder if there's any code in SIRC that was starting to target that and if it was a feature that was removed uh, later on but I'm pretty sure now that we have all of the details needed to uh, implement this code looks like it right so let's go to the code that's in the engine so here we are in the code in this scroller data.a file it starts to include the data for the what I call object properties but basically it's the uh, properties of the objects but in in the editor see editor it's called enemy bits but we had uh, FC bytes at memory address 3108 and that corresponds to the file offset that I noted down earlier on so if I convert the file offset by subtracting the header then adding on 900 in hex we get 3108 so let's put the real memory address in there now rather than the file offset of 3108 so uh, that corresponds to the SIEC file plus SIEC file data macro importing FC bytes from address 3108, which then gets converted to the file offset, don't forget. And then that's basically the encoding that's being used. So 36 times 7 bytes is 252, right? So that's FC. Anyway, so let's put that as a nicer number to look at so that we can understand where this data is coming from. FC was a bit of a magic number. So let's have a look at for, for the code which accesses this object properties. Well, we have an object properties table, which basically two tables of low and high values for the 36 enemies. I've got my cat coming to say hello. Hello, cat. Are you going to have a look at this code too? Anyway, so this low and high table of index values basically allows a faster lookup based on the enemy index value in the animation routine to converting to their relevant properties. Now, when an enemy is spawned in this routine here, it copies the relevant information from the properties using this indirected and, and indexed um, memory lookup, it copies them uh, into the relevant parts of the animation routine data tables, okay? Now, what we need to do is that we need to add some extra code for handling the collision detection with the uh, players and enemies and also uh, updating the animation enemy fire as well because part of the enemy properties the enemy bit contains the, the the firing sound effects the uh the fire the bullet animation how often things should fire the enemy should fire and what speed the bullet should be from the enemy so we will enable those two functions as well and we'll have a look at those in more detail but basically when an enemy is spawned it copies this working data it decodes it and then stores it inside the animation uh, table or animation table say for example the animation fire SFX the animation explosion SFX it decodes the values from the packed enemy bits data and then extracts it out into the animation tables for faster lookup later on so we want to do the expensive work here rather than doing expensive, difficult work, if you like, later on as the enemies are running. 
So basically, I'm pre-caching the data. Now, there are arguments to say that I shouldn't really waste time and effort processing the sound effects index until for the explosion, for example, until actually the enemy dies. Yes, that's probably the case, but the the indirected address in zero page is already set up. So I've already done the lookup for the enemy bits and I do need some of the enemy bits data to be able to set its speed of movement and stuff like that. So it makes sense to do all of this work here while the zero page addresses for this indirected memory access is set up. So here we can see I'm decoding the the movement speed for the animation and I'm decoding all of the other stuff as well by ex extracting out the relevant bits and then the last bits you know the, the collision logic I'm extracting the four bits for the for the collision logic there and that's going to be used for the for the collision detection routine there so it makes sense to reuse the the zero page indirected memory address that's already been set up to do all of this work right here rather than trying to restore that later on and then do the work later on when the enemy is exploding. Anyway, so all of this, the explosion type and everything can be extracted a little bit quicker by doing it here. But of course the enemy might not explode, so it might be wasted effort, but at least it's done here. Oh, my cat is looking very, very happy. She's getting ear tickles and head pats aren't you? Anyway, so let's have a look at the um, update enemy fire routine and that's in the animation engine.a source file. Uh, this is called uh, once per frame and it basically looks through all of the allocated uh, animations and if they are enemies or of enemy type it then starts processing the enemy shooting. So uh, if we have animation fire direction type, and if it's zero, branch on equal, then it just skips, right? So it's looking for an enemy, it's looking for something which has an enemy fire type. Uh, if it has an enemy fire type, then it looks at the, uh, the rate count. So the rate count is the counter of how fast it's going to fire. And then we have the init value, which is the starting value. So it counts that down every frame once it reaches, what is it, zero. And if we haven't got 10 enemy bullets on screen, uh, then it will spawn um, bullets. Uh, and there are various different pieces of information, like the enemy speed. Animation fire speed, don't forget, was extracted already into the animation uh, data tables by the enemy setup from the enemy bits. Uh, the enemy when it's moving around has this concept of direction so we decode the uh, direction for where the enemy should be firing to if if it's in the directional fire route uh, if the enemy bits have been configured with directional fire then it will use the last enemy movement direction to fire um, it tests for the plus and the x fire type as well uh, those are kind of like more special routines because they have to spawn four bullets all at the same time but going in different directions so we handle that. Otherwise it basically allocates or it looks for one bullet uh, to allocate in the animation data table. Obviously when it f tries to find an animation slot if there are no free slots then it doesn't do the bullet initialization it only does that bullet initialization if there are free slots. Anyway so we look at the last enemy fire direction type blah 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 we set the uh, direction um, if it's random fire then there's a random bullet direction table for speed basically and then that that table allows uh, bullets with different speeds to be shot at different directions uh, up down left right and the diagonals as well so we have a uh, we have a table which contains 32 values 0 to 31 basically and then we've got this semi random direction table here uh, those tables there are actually three of them and these tables have different speeds encoded in them so one is with 
speed one, two, and three. For example, the, the static bullet obviously doesn't need a lookup table into the random direction table because the speed is always zero, of course. Uh, so we have a little um, low and high table there pointing to the different ta random tables as well for quick lookup. Loading from those tables is done with a self-modified value piece of code. Now, because we're looking at the uh, code here, we've got the enemy AI uh, directional fire test as well, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. That's an extended feature of this engine. Uh, if we're looking at directional fire from the enemy, then it takes the enemy's movement direction and then encodes that as bullet speed X and bullet speed Y. So each animation, if they're bullet animations, but basically these are in the animation tables, it has each animation slot has a concept of speed X and speed Y for the bullets. And if the animation slot is of a type bullet, then it every frame incrementally adds those values to the x and the y position because it's signed arithmetic then we can encode or we can use negative and positive numbers to move left and right or up and down or correspondingly in the diagonal directions as well uh, the animation run collision detection routine basically looks at the uh, collision bits that were extracted and then does all of the complicated uh, logic to decide what happens when different sprites collide. Now, when we want to l know what sprites have collided, then the multiplexer was updated to return back um, sprite index values used in the multiplexer that are hitting other sprites. And this comes from the Commodore 64's uh, hardware sprite collision detection register. Lucky, very lucky that we have hardware that tells us when a sprite is colliding with another sprite. It doesn't tell us when sprite zero collides with sprite six or seven or five or whatever. It just tells us, it flags us that a sprite has collided with another sprite pixel. We're lucky that this, the, the VIC chip on the Commodore 64 does pixel accurate sprite collision detection to be honest. Um, it's a slightly unusual hardware feature to have sprite pixel accurate collision detection. Um, a lot of, you know, say for example arcade hardware didn't have that functionality at the time so it's very nice that Commodore decided to add that in their VIC chip. I mean some arcade hardware does have uh, pixel accurate collision detection with its sprites but a lot of arcade hardware doesn't even have that feature. So this multiplex collision index's last frame is basically a great big data table of, um, say for example, up to 32 indexes of sprites that are registering a collision with any other sprite. And those sprite index values used in the multiplexer correspond to, it's a one-to-one -one mapping, to the animation table slots. Now, these um, last frame values are actually copied from uh, the original multiplexer values at the end of the frame. And that's because I don't want the data table changing as the multiplexer uh, renders down the screen as the animation routine is working, as it's working when it's working on the next frame as the multiplexer is rendering the current frame. So I don't want uh, the multiplexer to update these values as I'm looking at them or rather as the animation routine is looking at them. I want to store them uh, in a safe place. So that store um, is done by this engine in a few different places, but depending on the uh, options being used for the assembly of this engine. So if the bottom borders are open, it will do the copy there. If the bottom borders are not open for the score display, and if you have a score panel, then it will do it there. If you are in full screen mode, it will do that copy at the end of the, the sprite multiplex, for example. So depending on the compiler, on the assembly options, compiler options, 
uh, it, it does the copy in different places but basically it it's, does it in a safe place for us. So the multiplex collision indexes is actually updated by this macro multiplex register collision macro. Now that macro is used in the multiplexer IRQs. Uh, if I show you in the sprite multiplexer, so without that option enabled, so without the logging collisions enabled, so not logging any collisions at all, there's no extra data appearing in the screen here, right? This is using 48 sprites, by the way. Uh, if I enable the log collisions, then it reduces magically ha the number of sprites, which is by design. I don't want to have to, to test it with 48 sprites because it uses extra code, so I cannot pack 48 sprites on the screen without corruption anyway. So I use a smaller number of sprites. So here on the screen now, I'm using uh, the screen memory to show the different tables. We've got the number of collisions there, and then we have a temporary working table, which it eight values long and then we have this variable length table here depending on the number of collisions which tells me which sprite index is colliding with any other sprite. So this log collision just basically gives you index values from 0 to say for example 31 uh, for however many sprites are colliding which is really quite cool and very useful for us because uh, we can use that information in the game engine. So the VIC2 sprite collision register is at D01E inside the VIC chip. If we want to uh, detect collision with the background, we could, but that's only a pixel level co uh, collision detection with the background, and CIRC doesn't use pixel accurate collision detection between the sprites and the background, it only does it with the sprites. So we don't want background collision, we just want sprite collision. So let's go back to the game engine now, the first time I was working on this, uh, originally I did character-based uh, collision, not with the hardware, but by detecting uh, characters on like a ghost screen, which would tell me if an enemy hit another enemy or the player and stuff. But then I figured out that, that Sirk was doing pixel-accurate collision, so I updated the multiplexer to give me pixel-accurate collision information. Uh, so once we know which sprite index values are colliding. We can then search the animation index values corresponding to those multiplexed sprite index values. Now we want to search a maximum of eight sprites backwards and, and then forwards as well, so that we're looking for, because we have a maximum of eight sprites hardware-wise, there's no point in searching all of the sprites in all of the animation tables against each other if it says that sprite zero or animation slot zero is colliding with something. We don't want to search all the way to the end of the animation slots because it's not going to be possible, right? There are a maximum of eight horizontal, eight hardware sprites in horizontal bands, so we can limit the search to within eight sprites of the animation index slot index or the multiplexer sprite index that, that we're looking at. So we can have this little table here which gives us uh, the range of uh, sprite values based on the multiplex index or basically the animation slot index because there's one-to-one -one mapping between the multiplex index and the animation slot index. Okay, So we can then use this little table here to figure out uh, the range of indexes that we're going to search in the animation slot and then we look at the types so if there is a so basically first of all even if a sprite says it's collided we need to check the bounding boxes to see if conceivably speaking that sprite could have collided with that other sprite we need to do the bounding box check to basically remove false positives for collisions with objects that are too far away to receive collisions. Because don't forget, we're not being told which sprite collides with what other sprite. We're being told, we're being told that a sprite has been collided. So we need to reduce that. Okay, so this is what the R sprites close routine does. Um, it takes uh, one index, sprite index in the X register, the other sprite index in the Y register, and it does some arithmetic, I'm going to document 
the entry values and the return values for this function because it's important to know. Uh, but basically, uh, it does a bounding box overlap check by doing some arithmetic between the coordinates. Okay, and if they're within a certain range, then we know that the bounding boxes are overlapping. Basically, subtracting one value from the other value and seeing if it's uh, less than, say, for example, the sprite height or the sprite size in the y direction and the sprite size in the x direction. Uh, it's at times like these that I wish the 6502 had a 9 bit or, you know, even better, a 16 bit um, comparison. And, and arithmetic, uh, but it doesn't, sadly. So the y, the y direction is okay because the y direction is, you know, one byte, eight bits, uh, zero to 255, that's fine. Um, it's the x position which uses nine bits where this kind of thing always falls over. Right? So the uh, exit values, uh, carry clear is what overlapping and carry set is not or something like that. So yeah, carry set is no hit. So if the sprites are close, then it does the animation type check. And the animation type is going to be set. Um, and then it, it's hit something typed. Uh, so this handles all of the checks between, uh, say for example, the, the, the enemies and the bullets and everything else. It rejects things like explosions because we don't care if we've hit explosions. Or if enemies hit explosions, we don't care. So it only it only considers uh, animation logic between certain types of animations. So if the player has hit the enemy, or if player two has hit the enemy, for example, or um, if a bullet has hit an enemy, player bullet that is. So then we have a look at the, and then if there are collisions, we look at this animation collision logic value which is inside the animation table which basically does a decode of these uh, collision bits that were set up uh, in in the in the high nibble uh, sorry the, the the lower nibble of those bits right so uh, that's why it does a an and with uh, binary one zero 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 which is don't remove bullet or remove bullet um, whether or not it's, say for example, say, uh, telling us to kill the player or not kill the player, and if it's an enemy to process the enemy's health and make it dead or not dead, or basically skip, <laughs> you know, it decrements the health, but uh, it yeah, makes it either dead or not dead, depending on if the health is re reduced to zero, right, for the enemy's health. Um, if it has been destroyed, then it does the points accumulation, uh, it calls the sound effects routine, or it will call the sound effects routine when, when we cover the reverse engineering for that section. There, uh, the the enemy doesn't need to allocate an explosion; it can mutate. Basically, the animation slot is reused. It quickly removes the enemy or replaces the enemy in the animation slot. It replaces the enemy data with the explosion data and then the explosion animation just starts at that same animation slot as the enemy. Um, it changes the type of course and stuff like that. So that's why this animate this style of animation routine is useful because everything is stored in the table. You can just change the animation from one type to the other just by updating the values in the animation table. Uh, the score add basically does as you would normally expect um, the kind of like standard adding of values so the input value is the accumulator number of points not multiplied by 10 so we're rendering it multiplied by 10 uh, but basically the score add routine just adds on uh, you know units tens uh, hundreds for example uh, there's also an, uh, an extra lives check as well. That comes with player limitations, which will be the next video. This is enemy bits. So that's those two routines there. Uh, with those two routines uh, enabled, we can then see what that looks like in uh, a nice example game data that we can have a look at. So if we uh, enable uh, uh, game one is already enabled. So let's run that. 
So uh, the new code here, this is new code that's running now. Let's, um, let's change it to normal borders. So here we are, uh, the new code running. Let's run the original CIRC example game on the left, like we've been doing with the other videos. Original CIRC is going to be on the left and new code is going to be on the right. So we can have an easier comparison. Let's make it so that it's approximately in the middle of the screen. There we go. Just getting set up here. There's the title screen, right? So, CIRC on the left, new code on the right. Let's just get CIRC a little bit more synchronized by pausing it for a couple of frames. And there we go. Okay, so we can see now that the enemies that are moving are moving uh, in synchronization with the original CIRC because the enemy speed has been pulled out properly now from the enemy bits. Uh, the enemies are firing. Oh, uh, I lost all of my lives in the new code. Uh, CIRC, the original CIRC, of course, is doing a, a cheat mode test where, where I've got infinite lives. <laughs> okay, let's look for the code which makes the player invulnerable. Uh, let's make the player invulnerable. So let's quickly disable the invulnerability check. Well, the invulnerability decrement. So if we, if we don't decrement the invulnerable flag, uh, then the player will never become in, uh, vulnerable. It will always be invulnerable. So okay, let's go back, change the screen. There we go, normal, normal Vic borders. Da, 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 da. Okay, start the game on the left, reset the game on the right. Boink, boink, there we go. Let's pause, see a synchronization, synchronize between the two. There we are. So now we have invulnerability and infinite lives. We can see that the enemies are moving in synchronization between the two versions original CIRC on the left and new code on the right. We can see that the different fire types are now being picked up, so those ones fire in the plus shape. Uh, there's an enemy gun emplacement which is static, which fires in the X shape. It's a different color, right? It's orange or something like that, or brown. Um, we can see, you know, the, the random direction fire is not synchronized, but that's because, you know, the CIRC has its own random table and I'm using a different one. But now we can see that the animation, the linked animations uh, work. The code on the right, which is the new code, is obviously faster. That's why the CIRC code on the left, which has been slowing down, is now out of sync with the code on the right. Um, I need to uh, pause the code on the right to bring it back in synchronization with CIRC. Of course, there we go. Let's synchronize that back up again. Dink. There we go, that's approximately in sync, right? We can see the gun emplacement, which is orange or brown, orange, right? Has the X shooting. We can see that the sprites, the ships that are coming down the screen are always shooting down. That one which was moving diagonally was shooting downwards. So we know that the forced direction rather than the directional fire is working. So everything looks pretty much exact now, right? Uh, the game for the new code now is, is coming very much to life. There are only a few other things to sort out now. The player limitations, uh, which covers things like the lives, extra lives that you get with the score, value, and um, what else? Uh, the spawning position, the, 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 the limitation where the player can move, um, and also uh, the title screen and sound effects. So there are only a few videos left in this series of CIRC reverse engineering. Uh, so because we have new code for all of this, <clears throat> we can enable things like aimed fire. So if we enable the code for aimed fire, the enemy AI test, the enemy AI test can do really cool things like this. So let's just enable the code and uh, the enemy AI test as well uses um, some special data 
basically I edited uh, Transputer Man, which was game game demo three or something like that, was it? Uh, to to alter the level a little bit and alter the attack waves, so that the enemies that certain enemy types which use uh, random fire would or directional fire rather would uh, use aimed fire so only certain enemy types would use the aimed fire so this is the new code and we can see that even though the player is in the middle of the screen the enemy goes around and the enemy is basically firing in the approximate direction uh, limited to diagonals of the player so the player is to the right of the enemy now and to the down to the right of the enemy or to the left of the enemy and the enemy is shooting in the approximate direction of the player when they're on the screen. The original SIRC code did not have this capability so this is like an example of how you can use this SIRC Redux code, uh, this new code, to improve the variation or the, the improve the behavior or capability of SIRC games because now you can have aimed fire at the player. So I move there, you see that the enemy starts shooting down and to the right, and then to the right. So it makes it more difficult, right, because you've got enemies shooting approximately at the player. So that's it for this video. Uh, we've successfully decoded the enemy bits. The next one, uh, the next video will be looking at player uh, configuration or the player limitations which is in the editor we haven't had a look at that yet before so we'll have a look at that so thank you very much for watching if you like these kind of uh, Commodore 64 retro games reverse engineering videos then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel and if you really really like the content then please send me a super thanks or even subscribe to the channel because it's greatly appreciated and it really helps me out with my uh, remaining hardware projects on the Commodore 64 as well. And that would be wicked sweet awesome. Thank you very much. Anyway, take care. Have a great day wherever you are.